The IBA owns and operates over 1,900 radio and television transmitters throughout the United Kingdom. 99.4% of the population can now receive ITV and Channel 4, and independent local radio is still expanding. As all IBA transmitters are normally unattended, our mobile maintenance teams are primarily responsible for their performance. Most stations have a wide range of complex equipment, as Mike Green from the Station Operations and Maintenance Department explains. The transmitters for independent local radio are often situated at UHF television stations. Besides making greater use of our buildings, this helps to reduce the proliferation of masts and towers for the aerials. Here we have a solid state 2 kilowatt VHF stereo transmitter, which is very reliable due to its parallel modular design. The left and right hand sound channels from the studios are normally connected to the transmitter site by music circuit landlines and arrive at this jack field. The input to the station can be checked either with headphones or the monitor loudspeaker. C682RTF, PJM193X. If one of the inputs should fail, the transmission continues in mono. Normally, the two sound channels are multiplexed by the encoder in the A drive. The B drive being the standby in case of failure. The stereo signal then passes through various combiners and filters to the parallel power amplifiers where the output level is metered before connection to the aerial feeder. Most VHF ILR transmissions are in mixed polarization. This provides the best overall reception on both vertically polarized aerials for car radios and portable receivers, which often have internal horizontal aerials. We shall be taking another look at radio in a few weeks' time when we visit an ILR studio but the prime purpose of this building is to house our ITV and Channel 4 transmitters. The use of UHF for TV broadcasting requires 51 main stations and about 850 relays. Transmitter sites are shared with the BBC and the present four television channels are always transmitted from the same mast. ITV began transmitting in the late 60s, and this 10 kilowatt transmitter was installed in 1971. By today's standards, it's both large and inefficient. Most of the ancillary plant could also be replaced by smaller modern units, but despite this, our planned maintenance schedules ensure a high level of reliability for the older generation of equipment. In 1982, Channel 4 began and we could take advantage of the improved efficiency of more advanced transmitters. These transmitters can also be easily adapted to carry dual channel sound, which is gradually being introduced. So let's take a closer look at the television signal path through the station. A microwave link is normally used to feed the program from the studios to the first main transmitter in an area. The link equipment is usually duplicated to provide a backup. Subsequent stations then simply rebroadcast the transmission on a different UHF frequency. In the case of a rebroadcast main station, there are two receivers to provide a baseband signal, video and audio. These are then processed by the program input equipment or PIE. This therefore always has two separate inputs known as the A and the B. The audio is again connected to a jack field for the purpose of monitoring or repatching if a different route through the PIE is required during maintenance. We add a low level 22.5 kilohertz tone to the television sound signal and this is sampled throughout the chain of the main stations to detect the presence of the sound signal even during quiet passages. The amplitude of the audio signal is also limited to prevent over-deviation of the transmitter FM sound carrier. The picture signal path is a bit more complicated because we have a very high specification 
for the performance of the vision transmitter. From the video termination panel, the signal passes through the sync pulse detectors, which monitor the presence and quality of the incoming signal. It is the sync detectors which initiate either a run-up or close-down of the whole transmitter. We also make extensive use of a vertical interval test signal to check the performance of our transmission networks. This signal is added to two lines of the television waveform, which don't carry picture information. They're located at the beginning of the vertical scan, next to the Oracle Teletext data lines. If the program input to the station is lost, we can transmit an apology caption. This originates from a caption generator in which a number of appropriate captions and a test card are digitally stored. The input and output signals are continuously measured by the automatic monitoring equipment. And if our performance limits are exceeded, remedial action can be taken either by the transmitter itself, remotely, or by the attendance of a maintenance team. All of our transmitters are designed to run automatically. The station status is telemetered to one of our four regional operation centers by the station controller. The audio and video signals are then fed to the transmitter and we will be following their progress in another program. In an earlier program, we looked at the routing of the television sound and picture signals from the transmitting station input to the output of the PIE, or program input equipment. Today, we follow their progress to the transmitting areas. The audio and video signals are fed next to the first stage of the transmitter, known as the transmitter drive. This provides a suitable UHF signal for the final power amplifier stage, which uses klystrons. These are non-linear devices which could severely distort the signals if corrective measures are not taken. This applies particularly to the vision signal, as the vision klystron is usually operated at its maximum output power level. Therefore, in order to counteract possible distortion of the radiated signal, we pre-distort the vision signal in the drive. The combined effect of the two opposite distortions is an undistorted signal at the output of the klystron. It's in the transmitter drive where most fine adjustments are made, which determine the overall performance of the transmitter, and the vertical interval test signal is again used for many of our measurements. And so the drive provides UHF signals of around 10 watts for the inputs of the sound and vision klystrons. These are wideband thermionic devices, which in our case operate at output powers of between 2 and 40 kilowatts. They are air and water cooled, and at the output end around the collector, a boiler is situated in which deionized water is evaporated by the heat generated in the klystron. This steam is then condensed and recirculated, so hardly any water is actually consumed. The transmitter has to be switched off before a key can be released to gain access to the beam supply for the klystrons, which require up to 20 kilovolts DC at about 2 amps. Most of our high power stations have two separate 11 kV feeds from the national grid, and this reduces the transmission time lost as a result of mains failures. The UHF signal from the drive is coupled to the beam of electrons which flows up the length of the klystron by the klystron input coupler. The response of the klystron to a particular frequency within its passband is determined by these cavities which are tuned circuits. Near the input coupler is the input cavity, followed by the second, third and output cavities. The amplified signal is extracted from the klystron by the output coupler. The output signal then leaves the klystron cubicle on this large coaxial feeder, which is often air-cooled. After passing through these harmonic filters, which prevent out-of-band radiation, 
the vision and sound output signals from the klystrons are combined in this rotor mode filter, which is the vision and sound combining unit for one transmitter. Many of our main stations, in fact, have two transmitters operating in parallel for each channel. In addition to increasing the output power, this also enables us to provide a reduced power service if one transmitter should fail completely. The combined vision and sound outputs from both transmitters in the case of a parallel station are fed to the feeder switching frame. At the top of the mast, there are usually two aerials, known as the upper and lower stack. Normally both aerials are in use, but it is possible to radiate a satisfactory service from only one of them, while maintenance is done on the other. The operation of the feeder switches determines the routing of the transmitter outputs to the upper and lower aerial stacks. When transmitters are being tested during maintenance, their outputs can be routed to a test load, which is again water-cooled and capable of absorbing the full output power of the transmitter. As the BBC and the IBA normally use the same transmitting aerials, our ITV and Channel 4 outputs have to be combined with BBC One and BBC Two before they begin their journey up the mast on the coaxial aerial feeders. Well, that was just a quick look at the technology we use at our transmitting stations. Our record of reliability means that much of what we do is seldom brought to the attention of viewers. But we hope you now have a better idea of one aspect of our involvement in the transmission of independent television. Hello and welcome to this week's engineering announcements from the IBA. Today we look at some of the equipment at a typical IBA high power television main transmitting station. In transmitter news, this week's maintenance work affecting existing stations and three new television relays, Aviemore and Arisaig in Highland and Harborne near Birmingham. More details later. The IBA owns and operates over 1,900 radio and television transmitters throughout the United Kingdom. 99.4% of the population can now receive ITV and Channel 4, and independent local radio is still expanding. As all IBA transmitters are normally unattended, our mobile maintenance teams are primarily responsible for their performance. Most stations have a wide range of complex equipment, as Mike Green from the Station Operations and Maintenance Department explains. The use of UHF for TV broadcasting requires 51 main stations and about 850 relays. Transmitter sites are shared with the BBC, and the present four television channels are always transmitted from the same mast. ITV began transmitting in the late 60s, and this 10 kilowatt transmitter was installed in 1971. By today's standards, it's both large and inefficient. Most of the ancillary plant could also be replaced by smaller modern units, but despite this, our planned maintenance schedules ensure a high level of reliability for the older generation of equipment. In 1982, Channel 4 began and we could take advantage of the improved efficiency of more advanced transmitters. These transmitters can also be easily adapted to carry dual channel sound, which is gradually being introduced. So let's take a closer look at the television signal path through the station. A microwave link is normally used to feed the program from the studios to the first main transmitter in an area. The link equipment is usually duplicated to provide a backup. But not all main stations are fed from microwave links. Some simply pick up the UHF signals off air and rebroadcast them on a different channel. 
In the case of a rebroadcast main station, there are two receivers to provide a baseband signal, video and audio. These are then processed by the program input equipment, or PIE. This therefore always has two separate inputs, known as the A and the B. A low level 22.5 kHz tone is added to the television sound signal. This is used by all main stations in the chain to check that program sound is present even during periods of silence. A limiter prevents high amplitude audio signals causing over deviation of the frequency modulated sound carrier. The picture signal path is a bit more complicated with a very high specification for the performance of the vision transmitter. From the video termination panel, the signal passes through the sync pulse detectors, which monitor the presence and quality of the incoming signal. It is the sync detectors which initiate either a run-up or close-down of the whole transmitter. We also make extensive use of a vertical interval test signal to check the performance of our transmission networks. If the program input to the station is lost, we can transmit an apology caption. This originates from a caption generator in which a number of appropriate captions and a test card are digitally stored. The input and output signals are continuously measured by the automatic monitoring equipment. And if our performance limits are exceeded, remedial action can be taken either by the transmitter itself, remotely, or by the attendance of a maintenance team. All of our transmitters are designed to run automatically. The audio and video signals are then fed to the transmitter, and we will be following their progress in another program. And we'll hear more from Mike Green in a couple of weeks. In an earlier program, we looked at the routing of the television sound and picture signals of the input to a main transmitting station. Today, we follow their progress to the transmitting aerials. The audio and video signals are fed next to the first stage of the transmitter, known as the transmitter drive. This provides a suitable UHF signal for the final power amplifier stage, which uses klystrons. Klystrons are non-linear devices, especially when delivering the high output powers needed for the vision signal. Therefore, in order to counteract possible distortion of the radiated signal, we pre-distort the vision signal in the drive. The combined effect of the two opposite distortions is an undistorted signal at the output of the klystron. It's in the transmitter drive where most fine adjustments are made, which determine the overall performance of the transmitter, and the vertical interval test signal is again used for many of our measurements. And so the drive provides UHF signals of around 10 watts for the inputs of the sound and vision klystrons. These are wideband thermionic devices which in our case operated output powers of between 2 and 40 kilowatts. They are air and water cooled and at the output end around the collector a boiler is situated in which deionized water is evaporated by the heat generated in the klystron. This steam is then condensed and recirculated so hardly any water is actually consumed. The transmitter has to be switched off before a key can be released to gain access to the beam supply for the klystrons, which require up to 20 kilovolts DC at about two amps. Most of our high power stations have two separate 11 kV feeds from the national grid, and this reduces the transmission time lost as a result of mains failures. The UHF signal from the drive is coupled to the beam of electrons which flows up the length of the klystron by the klystron input coupler. The response of the klystron to a particular frequency within its passband is determined by these cavities which are tuned circuits. Near the input coupler is the input cavity, followed by the second, third and output cavities. The amplified signal is extracted from the klystron by the output coupler. The output signal then leaves the klystron cubicle on this large coaxial feeder which is often air-cooled. After passing through these harmonic filters, which prevent out-of-band radiation, the vision and sound output signals from the klystrons are combined in this rotor mode filter, which is the vision and sound combining unit 
for one transmitter. Many of our main stations, in fact, have two transmitters operating in parallel for each channel. In addition to increasing the output power, this also enables us to provide a reduced power service if one transmitter should fail completely. The combined vision and sound outputs from both transmitters in the case of a parallel station are fed to the feeder switching frame. At the top of the mast, there are usually two aerials, known as the upper and lower stack. Normally both aerials are in use, but it is possible to radiate a satisfactory service from only one of them, while maintenance is done on the other. The operation of the feeder switches determines the routing of the transmitter outputs to the upper and lower aerial stacks. When transmitters are being tested during maintenance, their outputs can be routed to a test load, which is again water-cooled and capable of absorbing the full output power of the transmitter. As the BBC and the IBA normally use the same transmitting aerials, our ITV and Channel 4 outputs have to be combined with BBC One and BBC Two before they begin their journey up the mast on the coaxial aerial feeders. Well, that was just a quick look at the technology we use at our transmitting stations. Our record of reliability means that much of what we do is seldom brought to the attention of viewers. But we hope you now have a better idea of one aspect of our involvement in the transmission of independent television. This week's transmitter news now starting... We shall be taking another look at radio in a few weeks' time when we visit an ILR studio, but the prime purpose of this building is to house our ITV and Channel 4 transmitters. We shall be taking another look at ILR. We shall be taking another look at ILR in a few weeks' time when we visit an... That's wrong. It's written. Okay, I'm rolling. We shall be taking another look at radio in a few weeks' time when we visit an ILR studio. But the prime purpose of this building is to house our ITV and Channel 4 transmitters. our buildings, it also reduces the proliferation of masts and towers for the aerial. Right. Then if you want to... Sorry? Speak again. Just walk over there. Oh, nothing. Ah. Here we go. Tough connection on there, the air, yeah. probably the aerial if it's... Is it a badger connection a bit, does ITV began transmitting in the late 60s, and this 10 kilowatt transmitter was installed in 1971. By today's standards, it's both large and inefficient. ITV began transmitting in the late 60s, and this 10 kilowatt transmitter was installed in 1971. By today's standards, it's both large and inefficient. In 1982, Channel 4 began, and we could take advantage of the improved efficiency of more advanced transmitters. rowing. In 1982, Channel 4 began and we could take advantage of the improved efficiency of more advanced transmitters. The audio... Oh, The audio and video signals are fed next to the first stage of the transmitter 
known as the transmitter drive. This provides a suitable UHF signal for the final power amplifier, which uses tristrons. in which demineralized water is evaporated by the heat generated in the klystron. This steam is used to provide a baseband signal, video and audio. These are first processed by the program input equipment, or PIE. Yeah. Have a rolling. In the case of a rebroadcast main station, there are two receivers to provide a baseband signal, video and audio. These are first processed by the program input equipment, or PIE. Rolling. And the B. The audio is again connected to a jack field for the purpose of monitoring or repatching if a different route through the PIE is required during maintenance. This therefore always has two separate inputs, known as the A and the B. The audio is again connected to a jack field for the purpose of monitoring or repatching if a different route through the PIE is required during maintenance. If the program input to the station is lost, we can transmit an apology caption. This originates from a caption generator. Okay. If the program input to the station is lost, we can transmit an apology caption. This originates from a caption generator in which a number of appropriate captions and a test card are digitally stored. They are designed to run automatically. The station status. Right? All our transmitters are designed to run automatically. The station's status is telemetered to one of our four regional operation centers by the transmitter controller. The transmitter has to be switched off before a key can be released to gain access to the beams of charter. You can't do this in one. <laughs> it's got to go all the way down, otherwise you don't get the key out. Take this rolling. maintenance is done for the other. Normally both aerials are in use, but it is possible to radiate a satisfactory service from only one of them, while maintenance is done on the other. To just void are fed to the feeder switching frame. At the top of the mast, there are usually two areas, known as the upper and lower stack. Yes, I'll try. It's a quick bit of action. Yeah. From the video termination panel, the signal passes through the sync pulse detectors, which monitor the presence and quality of the incoming signal. Sorry, 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 sorry. From the video termination panel, the signal passes through the sync pulse detectors, which monitor the presence and quality of the incoming signal. Up here? No, there is better. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah, the chocolate jam there.
The transmitters for independent local radio are often situated at... at Yeah, okay. The transmitters for independent local radio are often located with UHF television stations. That's not right, is it? Uh, Situated uh, at UHF television. Uh, In addition to making greater use of our buildings, sorry, right, sorry. Right. In addition to making greater use of our buildings, it also reduces the proliferation of masts and towers for the area. Right. Sorry? Speak again. Here we go. <coughs> Tough connection on there. The air, probably the aerial if it's. Not the aerial? I think that's probably what it is, because there's six of the road in there. No, it's... Uh, they've all got connections. Yeah, they've all got a connection the same oh, time. Oh, yeah. They're, 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 are often located with UHF television stations. Besides making great e <laughs> in addition to, sorry? Is this, is that, is that